Good morning and welcome to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. For those of you familiar with my channel, you may know that I recently released a video in regards to the laser thermal method of propulsion, a very breakthrough type of technology that's been around for quite some time, but nevertheless has only really been brought back into the public eye recently. And I have the co-authors of a paper on this subject, Dr. Dr. Andrew Higgins, or rather Professor Andrew Higgins and Emmanuel Duple. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Happy to be here. Glad, glad to be here. All right. Um, so first of all, let's get down to the basics. A lot of my viewers are very familiar with with a lot of things that are, you know, space flight oriented, but this is a little bit different. Let's get down to the basics of how this works. Sure. Emmanuel, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, essentially, we're, we're taking uh, the idea from uh, the, the laser-driven light sails, Breakthrough Star Shot, um, and using a, a ground-based laser to uh, heat up a propellant on a spacecraft. So you focus that laser into a thrust chamber. Uh, it's like a steam kettle. Uh, raise the pressure, raise the temperature, and then you expel that out the back to uh, give you propulsion. Sounds uh, straightforward enough. So, I mean, in the nuts and bolts of things, how would something like this be accomplished? I mean, it's it. You know, there's a lot of ambitious technology involved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, the large uh, laser array is it's not uh, completely feasible, but it's it's definitely a big project in of itself. Um, we're looking at just a ten meter diameter array, which is small compared to say the bigger ones considered for these uh, interstellar projects um but still bigger than anything we've really ever seen so far so that's already one big uh big challenge um beyond that um there are still you know uh, we need to be able to set up the spacecraft in orbit with a, a large reflector that is capable of taking this laser flux and reflecting it and focusing it into this this trust trust chamber um which again uh there has been some there's some flight heritage with these inflatable reflectors uh they've been used for well there's been experiments uh, to be used as communications antennas um and also for solar thermal propulsion but nothing really of the order that we're, we're considering yet um and then yep so, I mean, what makes this better or more feasible than a light sail? So, uh, the issue with the light sail is that the amount of payload you can really take with that is uh, extremely small, actually, because the radiation pressure that you can get uh, on a given amount of area, uh, even with these laser-driven sails, is, uh, is still not enough to push payloads even on the order of a kilogram, right? Uh, when we're talking about these interstellar sails, uh, we're thinking of gram-sized spacecraft at most. Um, and so if we want to do anything, say, a bit more useful, at least in the solar system, uh, one gram doesn't really get us anywhere. Um, so the advantage of laser propulsion in this case, uh, laser thermal, is that we can actually scale up that payload to a ton, to 40 tons, uh, you know, payload sizes that can really enable uh, the settlement of Mars, uh, the exploration of the outer planets with like lots of scientific equipment. Uh, so we're, we're not as payload limited uh, in that sense. And uh, we are not as time limited in the sense that in laser electric propulsion would be. Now, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say... Uh, we were able to do these missions in about, you know, an hour uh, of burn time, and then uh, that, that's all we need, whereas laser electric propulsions, that usually takes several hours, two days of, uh, of maneuver time. So one of my understandings of how this works is that you're using essentially the, the stage, the laser thermal stage, to fling 
the spacecraft on its way to make it reusable. Can you describe the reusable aspect of how this process would work? Yes, so um, essentially, at first we considered a mission where we simply just let the, uh, the laser thermal propulsion system go with the payload since we thought, well, there's no point in keeping it around. But we realized that um, even just in terms of the, the technology that's on board, it would be a shame to get rid of it. And also given the advent of reusable uh, launch vehicles, um, it's more interesting really to design architectures that don't rely on disposable hardware. So we looked at bringing back this laser thermal propulsion system with the, the, the same you know, uh, system to actually send it out to Mars. We can fire up the laser again uh, on the propulsion system on its own without the payload and bring it back, uh, do a reverse burn essentially to bring it back in Earth orbit. Uh, and the amount of extra propellant you actually need to do this is uh, not, this is very minor actually compared to the initial amount. Um, and I think that's the same lesson that SpaceX learned is that because your propulsion system is doesn't have a payload, doesn't need to carry all of the propellant it usually carried, well, initially, uh, it doesn't need that much extra to actually come back and uh, be ready for a reuse. Now you, so, you know, there's no no laser on Mars yet. Yeah. So the bringing bringing the whole laser propulsion system to Mars doesn't really gain you much. It's just dead weight. But if you can do a, a flip and burn and, and bring it back, then in principle, we could we could use this system several times within a given launch window. So when the planets line up and it's time to go to Mars, you could you could you know maybe every couple of days use this system to send payload to Mars and keep bringing it back. So that being the case, um, you're talking about uh, three thousand seconds worth of ISP um, is is what your paper discusses. Am I to understand then that fifteen hundred or so seconds of ISP would be used to fling the spacecraft towards Mars, and then fifteen hundred ISP to bring it back to cis lunar space to use it again? How how does that work? No, it would be it would be probably using ISP three thousand seconds for both burns. So you know, again, ISP is really just a measure of the efficiency. It's how how efficient are you at converting propellant into thrust. So we would want to keep the ISP around that value. You know, twenty five hundred to three thousand seconds is really what you need to enable these rapid rapid transit missions. If you want to get to Mars fast, that's kind of the the ballpark you need to be in that combined with high thrust. That's truly astonishing. So, I mean, you, you know, you're looking at some of the finest chemical engines at 450 ISP total. And you're looking at essentially, I mean, if you combine both around 6,000 then. I mean, is that is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, you don't, ISP isn't, isn't additive like that. So ISP is just uh, put, a, put a propulsion unit on a thrust stand feed it propellant, you know, and then take the thrust that you, you find and divide it by the, 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 the flow rate of the propellant, the, the kilograms per second of the propellant. And then it just comes out in this weird unit of seconds. That's kind of a historical artifact from the fact that rockets were developed when we were still using the, you know, imperial system of units. So really it's just a measure of how well you're converting propellant into thrust. And uh, you, you want that number high, but but not too high. So if the, if the ISP gets very, very high, what happens is you're using a, a tiny amount of propellant and that's kind of where uh, electric propulsion sits. So ion engines and those kind of concepts, they use a tiny amount of propellant and generate a tiny amount of thrust because they're limited by the power available. Whereas here we don't have a limit with the power. We have the big laser back on earth delivering us all the power that we need. So maybe just to put it in, in context, I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners know about the NERVA project, the nuclear thermal rocket from the 1960s that right. you know, reached quite a high level of maturity. In fact, you know, uh, NERVA probably would have would have flown if we kept doing Apollo missions. There probably would have been a NERVA upper stage on some of the you know Apollo Apollo 20. Yes. Um, so our, our concept or the laser thermal propulsion concept sort of sits in the same parameter space that. Uh, nuclear thermal rockets do in terms of high ISP, high specific impulse and high thrust. But we can actually get higher than NERVA did in terms of ISP. Uh, the, the concept, the laser thermal concept sits almost on top of a, 
in, in its performance on top of a concept called the gas core, gas core nuclear thermal rocket. So this would overcome the material limitation of the traditional solid core nuclear thermal rocket like NERVA by replacing a, a, a solid fueled reactor with a rocket that had a big uranium plasma ball in the center of the heating chamber. And that was never allowed to come in contact with the walls. So the, the hydrogen that would be heated by that big plasma ball could get to temperatures as great as 50,000 Kelvin, which is what you need to get ISPs of 3,000 seconds. So there were just sort of two issues with the gas core nuclear thermal rocket. So one was that it, it leaked the uranium propellant out, so you were losing some of your propellant, uh, and that would ultimately limit how long it could operate for. And the second problem was it leaked uranium propellant, so it had massively radioactive exhaust, which means you wouldn't want to operate it on or anywhere near Earth. You know, in deep space it's okay, but then the question is how would you develop it and, and test it? So uh, we, our concept sits almost exactly on top of where that gas core nuclear thermal rocket would sit in terms of specific impulse and, and, and uh, thrust. In fact, we benefited a lot. Emmanuel and his team used a lot of those studies from the late 60s, early 70s to help us with the heat transfer and design of the heating chamber. Uh, but the beauty is we have no radioactive uh, exhaust and we don't even need to carry any nuclear reactor at all. We, we leave the power source back on Earth and beam the, the energy in the form of a laser. Okay, so back on Earth, we have our nuclear reactor or solar power or wind power or anything else you can use to, to power your laser. So really, it's a it's a it's a win win. You know, we, we get rid of the, the reactor, but we still have the the high power that gives us the high thrust. Now, you still need a tremendous amount of heat in order to superheat the propellant. Uh, question number one, when you're superheating the propellant, are you also ionizing it? And then secondly, um, at what sort of temperatures are you looking at and how do you contain them? So yeah, we, we absolutely uh, ionize the propellant. Um, we, uh, we take that into account when we compute our, our ISP actually. Uh, we actually have a plasma core uh, at the center of the thrust chamber. So it's completely ionized. We're looking at a core temperature of 30 to 40,000 Kelvin. And um, that is going to radiate heat away uh, and heat up the surrounding hydrogen. Uh, we're thinking, I mean, in our calculations, we, we took caught all of the energy that was in the input in the thrust chamber and we computed the average temperature of that hydrogen gas as it comes out of the nozzle or as it enters the nozzle uh, to about 10,000 Kelvin. Um, so 10,000 Kelvin, and uh, what method are you going to use to control that sort of temperature? So as Professor Hagen said, um, we took a lot of inspiration from the work done on gas core nuclear rockets. Uh, and a lot of designs for these engines actually use uh, something called porous wall cooling or transpiration cooling. Uh, the idea being that you inject the propellant in the thrust chamber from pretty much all sides of the chamber through a porous membrane that allowed the cold propellant to uh, absorb the radiated heat and prevent it to be transmitted to the actual solid walls of the rocket. And so uh, you, you basically cushion that the inner walls of the, the, the thrust chamber with colder propellant um, that's there to, to block the heat from going past it. Now, another question to transition to a different issue. You're looking at uh, speeds of around almost 14 kilometers per second of delta V. I mean, you're going to be hurtling towards Mars like a bat out of hell um, at that kind of speed. And you don't, at least in your current design, unless you have a second stage with you know hydrogen fuel and a laser at Mars to slow it down, you're hitting the Martian atmosphere at 14 kilometers per second. Do you really feel confident that aerobraking is going to be able to handle that? And if so, how? It's, uh, it is a delicate maneuver, right? There's not uh, a lot of margin for error uh, as far as we know. So there's still a lot of uh, work to be done to actually 
uh, ensure that this maneuver would work. Uh, but in terms of the G loads that we've seen in our calculations and the heat loads, uh, nothing seems to be saying that it's, it's not possible, right? We've managed to find trajectories that limit the G load to eight Gs, which is survivable. Um, some have even some who have experienced it have even said it's almost fun. Um, and in terms of heat load, it's definitely uh, beyond what we've seen in any reentry so far. But uh, the heat flux that we've calculated is still under some of the. Uh, material limits that we've seen for for um, heat shield uh, materials that are being developed at the moment. What sort of reentry temperatures when you're aero braking are we looking at versus the reentry temperature of Apollo hitting you know the Earth's atmosphere coming back from the Moon, for example? I think it's comparable. Yeah, it's it's the the heating rates are, 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 are similar to uh, Apollo reentry. Yeah, it's a good good, good comparison to make. Yeah. And it's because of the density of Earth's atmosphere, right? Even though you'd be hitting the atmosphere at a much higher level of delta V, the uh, density of Earth's atmosphere would would obviously heat up the ship more. Is, is am I understanding that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a complex calculation. It's, you know, Mars's atmosphere is different molecular weight, and, you know, there's a lot of issues that come in, but it's, you know, I think that's a good good analogy is coming in uh, like a, like Apollo reentry. So the, the technique that Emmanuel and his team developed for this design is that we would come in uh, and just skim the atmosphere, uh, and we would use lift. So the, the, the vehicle has to have the ability to generate a little bit of aerodynamic lift, but interestingly, we point the lift vector down. So we point the lift uh, down towards Mars. And what that allows us to do is kind of hug the curvature of Mars so we can stay in the atmosphere as long as we can, so we can we can lessen the heat load and lessen the G loads. So the idea is just skim the atmosphere just in just deep enough to, to, to give you the braking that you need. You know, don't plunge in too deep because then you'll burn up. Uh, but if you don't plunge in enough, you'll you'll skip off and go back out into interplanetary space. Uh, so you know that's kind of how we solved it. Initially, we 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 came up with it with an analytic kind of paper and pencil solution, which said, how can you just skim along the surface of Mars? Uh, use use aerodynamics to keep your your curvature matching the curvature of the surface of Mars. Keep the G load reasonable. We set eight Gs as a limit. We thought that was reasonable, and then keep the heating load uh, comparable to what the state of the art materials would be for for uh, uh, reentry vehicles. So there's been some interesting materials developed by NASA in the last few years that that can can withstand this heat flux even greater. We could probably even withstand greater heat flux, and so we kind of found a sweet spot of solution there. And then we went back and did more detailed. Computer simulations, you know, full degree of three, uh, three degree of freedom simulations, where you integrate, you know, the full motion of the spacecraft in the atmosphere. So it looks promising, but yeah, it would be a wild ride, you know, for basically yeah. hugging the, the 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 curvature of Mars all the way around Mars in a in a in a plasma fireball as you decelerate at at eight Gs. But it's uh, it looks feasible. Now, if we're talking about a 45-day transition time, obviously the aerobraking Mars capture orbit thing, that takes time too. So how much more additional time would it take for the whole um, capture orbit scenario to get the Delta V down to the sufficient speed to where you could re-enter and theoretically land? I mean, I'm talking about a manned mission here, which is what my viewers are interested in. I mean, how long does that extend your your uh, your travel time? So the actual air braking maneuver is is quite fast compared to the transit time. Uh, you're going in so quickly and, and got such a high velocity rel relative to Mars that the this air braking maneuver actually takes about you spend five minutes or so, five to ten minutes in the atmosphere, um, and then you know uh, the idea was would be that. Once you get out of the atmosphere, you, you're still on an orbit around Mars, so you still have another orbit to go to actually attempt 
an actual landing, but all of this would happen in a matter of hours. Um, this this doesn't really add anything uh, to the, the the whole transit time. Uh, we did consider more well, well softer air braking maneuvers, so you lose less speed at a time. But we realized that well, if you wanted to do it that way, you would just defeat the purpose of trying to cut that that transit time to forty five days. So this this has to happen quite quickly. Forty five days. That's a that's very quickly. Um, far far more rapid than I would have thought to transition in the time that we have remaining. Um, obviously, if you can get to Mars in 45 days, your ability to reach the Jovian worlds, the outer solar system, becomes that much less. I mean, how do you foresee this, uh, this transportation system being used to, to reach Jupiter, Saturn, or even the ice giants? Uh, well, a great advantage of this technology is that now you can uh, plan missions that can go directly to these uh, giant planets, right? Uh, so far, the preferred method of doing this was to use a lot of gravity assist, uh, which is very efficient, uh, but it adds a lot of time to your mission. And so you send out your mission and you have to wait a decade until uh, you can actually do your science. Uh, with a propulsion system like this, you can send it straight where you want it to go and cut down that transit time, you know, on the same order of magnitude as we do here with Mars. Um, you can even extend these missions to even further the, for the outer reach of the, of the solar system and begin doing uh, proto-interstellar missions, right? So in our paper, we mention a possible target being the solar gravitational focus, where you can use the sun actually as a sort of telescope to uh, image things such as exoplanets with multi-pixel resolution. So that's very exciting. Very exciting indeed. So, look, it's um, there are many, many different alternative propulsion systems out there. I mean, you know, we, I did a paper on the Mach effect drive and and the pseudo science involved with that. Um, so, you know, I mean, when do you foresee, let's assume NASA gives you the go-ahead, let's assume NASA gives you some funding. I mean, how rapidly could you actually produce a prototype of some kind, perhaps for a small unmanned probe or something? How rapidly could, could something like that be constructed? It's going to be a significant development effort. So the biggest issue is the laser. So right now the biggest lasers that have ever been built are in the, you know, 100 kilowatt class, we need to get to 100 megawatt. So this is a, you know, would be a thousand times more than any laser ever built. But the hope is that we can leverage the revolution that's happening in photonics and telecommunications. So our work is largely based off that of, of Philip Lubin at UC Santa Barbara, uh, whose work also was the foundation of the breakthrough star shot. So the concept is, uh, you can build lasers now using fiber optics, not just fiber optics to deliver the laser light, but the laser itself, the lasing medium, is made up of just a loop of fiber optic. So it can be made very, very in inexpensive. That's how we make lasers now for telecom and, and, and laser welding, laser cutting. And then you can just stack them up. You can just kind of the, the way we now at universities build supercomputers is we just buy NVIDIA graphics cards thousands of them, and we stack them up, and voila, we have a supercomputer. So there's a similar idea here. We, if we can get these fiber optic lasers cheap enough, we can just stack them up by the thousands, eventually millions, and build in parallel a giant phased array laser like this. So that's going to take some development. People are working on that. We're not directly working on the laser technology, but people are around the world as part of Breakthrough Starshot and, and, and just the general revolution that's happening in photonics and lasers. I think that's going to take a decade or more. Uh, I don't think we need this technology to get to Mars. So I'm, I'm a big supporter of Robert Zubra, and I believe that the way to get to Mars in the preliminary missions is just to, is just to tough it out and get there in a six-month uh, free return trajectory. But once we start establishing a presence on Mars, then I think there will be interest in getting there faster. There are probably people who would be willing to, to pay to get there faster to avoid the cosmic... Uh, radiation that you get from, from galactic cosmic rays and the deleterious effects of being weightless for, for six months or longer. Uh, so I think it'll be the destination that derives the development of the propulsion. And we still have got the problem of how to get back. So we need to either build another laser on Mars, 
or find another way to get back, get back quickly. So I think if we had we had figured out how to get there and back uh, with 45 days both ways, then I think NASA would, would do it. I think if you can show how to get to Mars, do a, a round trip Mars mission maybe in six months, we would do that right now because we 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 know how to keep people alive in space for six months, but two and a half years is is quite a stretch. That would be yeah. quite a gamble to send people doing that. I think people are willing to take the risk, but it's a gamble. Now, of course, the other benefit of massive laser arrays is, of course, the uh, you know the utilization for asteroid comet uh, deflection, that sort of thing. I mean, it has more uses besides just going to other planets really fast. Also, the concept of using lasers in in orbit, right, to to transmit power back to Earth. I mean, do you foresee that all of this could be consolidated through the Department of Energy and uh, you know Space Force, Department of Defense, etc., in order to get the funding, in order to get the uh, the enthusiasm, the sense of urgency? Do you have any ideas in that regard? Yeah, I mean the laser does does provide the the option for an, an, an architecture to get around the solar system anywhere you want to go quickly. As this, we would need to have uh, someone with with some deep pockets commit to building uh, a prototype laser of the power levels we need here on Earth. So I think yeah, probably Department of Energy, Department of Defense would be the appropriate people to do that. I, I think what we need for for this general field of directed energy is something like the, the DCX program, which your older reviewers will, will uh, uh, remember, you know, was a, was a demonstration that yes, a rocket can take off and land vertically. It can do this with quick turnaround. Uh, that was in the early 1990s and really opened up a lot of people's thinking. And the, the DNA from that effort is what has now led to, to Blue Origin and SpaceX and all the other companies looking at reusability. I think we need a moment like that. We need a DCX moment for, for uh, a directed energy laser propulsion. And it needs, you know, someone similar to what happened in DCX, someone uh, somewhere in the U.S. government, I think, is the right place to do it, to commit to doing some kind of technology demonstration of, of, of beamed energy. And there really hasn't been significant demonstrations of that. Uh, you know, there, there's been a few tests here and there at this sort of 10 kilowatt level showing you can beam energy and do propulsion. But we need to make a commitment to build a facility you know, out in a desert someplace or in a tunnel underground, something safe, something's not going to threaten anybody uh, that can can show what you can do with, with real laser-delivered energy. This is all very exciting, something I certainly support. I talk about alternative power sources all the time. Anything you would like to add real quick? Uh, no, I mean, I would just maybe encourage people. Uh, I think, Jordan, you wanted to talk a bit about whether the laser could be used for transportation from the surface of the Earth to orbit. Right. Uh, now, that's an interesting concept. I've been keen on that for, for many, many decades. Uh, probably the, the principal players there was, was uh, uh, Jordan Kerr, who unfortunately we lost a couple of years ago, and, and, and Leek Mirabeau. Many of your uh, listeners probably know of, of their work. The challenge there is if you want to go from the surface of the Earth to orbit, you don't need now megawatts or hundreds of megawatts. You really need gigawatts. So if you look at what a, a Raptor engine is, that's that's a gigawatt of power. I, you know, a, a Falcon 9 on liftoff is multiple gigawatts of power. So if you want to replace that chemical energy with a laser, you, you now need a very, very serious laser. So for example, what Jordan Kerr and Leek Mirabeau were, was, were working on is seeing how small of a vehicle you could make to get to orbit. You know, tiny, tiny launch vehicles. So that was an interesting approach. Um, I, I'm also a big fan of other alternative approaches. I spent my early part of my career working on gun launch to space. I worked on something called Ram Accelerator, which is a kind of a gun launch to space concept. But I would just encourage people to, to think about right now, you know, companies like SpaceX are, are really hitting the ball out of the park with, with every swing of the bat. And to try to compete with them, I think is going to be very difficult. And, and even if uh, Starship ran into some serious development programs, which it, it, I don't think it will, but you know, if, if it did, there's a lot of other players waiting in the wings, Blue Origin, Rocket Labs, Relativity, Firefly, I'm, I'm sure your, your, your viewers know all of these companies that are probably going to step in and realize this. So if you want to work on other concepts out there, I would encourage people to, to maybe sit out the, the Wild West show that's going to be access to low Earth orbit 
and think about the next step. Think about you know what what how what's the best technology to get around the solar system, and ultimately what our group at McGill is interested in is how to get to the stars. We want to work on technologies that can eventually evolve to a true interstellar capability. That's why we're keen on the laser. The laser thermal rocket is not going to get us to the stars. It's still a rocket. It still suffers the tyranny of the rocket equation. But that same laser could be used to launch these smaller kind of gram scale uh, light sails to, to launch a true interstellar probe. So I guess I would ask your viewers to, you know, maybe think about that. Set, set your sights a little further out. As I tell my students, you know, by the time you graduate, Elon is already going to have his city on Mars. So let's cast our gaze a little further out and, and think about going to the stars. Well, that sounds like a great topic for a future interview. It sounds like you're heading a little bit towards breakthrough star shot or something along those lines. Um, very excited in that as well. Gentlemen, I want to express my deepest appreciation for you joining us today. Um, and thanks so much for being part of the program. Sure, it's been a great, great pleasure. Have a lovely day. So if we truly want to become an interplanetary civilization with the ambition of becoming an interstellar civilization, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>